So let's go to uh, for 2 Corinthians 11. We're at the very end of 2 Corinthians 11. If you remember, Paul had just gone through all of his credentials and he had gone through all of his hardships. And he didn't want to boast about it. He, he boasted because he thought it was necessary to do so because of the false apostles, because of the super apostles. And so what he did is he boasted of his weaknesses. And I mean, nobody does that. Nobody does that, right? And he's like, nope. You know, when I'm weak, he's strong. And so he wanted to let them know that this is what he's gone through. But God has gone before him and he's taken him through all of this. Remember when I said nothing and no one can touch you inside of God's will, right? Nothing and no one can touch you inside of God's will. Paul could have been, what, killed a gazillion times or he could have died out in the wilderness, right? Any, any time. But meanwhile, nothing and no one can touch you inside of God's will. And so he kept on keeping on. So he boasted about all of his weaknesses, but how God then kept him and worked through him. And so now he's going to go and he's going to share about, about boasting one more time about his weakness. And we're going to go into what that looks like, how there's power and weakness. And then we're going to go into how he's going to quote boast, but in the third person, because you know he's so humble about a vision that he had. Okay, so let's read first uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30, just to the end of the chapter. Paul is saying, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father, the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Okay, so he says, look, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in my infirmities. I'm going to boast in my weakness. And it's like, who does that? Right? Who does that? But he wanted to keep humble. He wanted to absolutely, he wanted to write about Jesus all the time. And meanwhile, he needed to write about himself because he needed to be able to show the Corinthian Christians because they didn't think he was the best apostle because he was so weak right, in these areas, but he wanted to show them that this actually is power. This is power in this. And so he's boasting, okay, and he says, look at what are, what are his credentials as an apostle? Only his scars. Only his scars. That's what he's talking about. Those are his credentials as an apostle, right? The, the things which concern my infirmity, which concern my weakness, right? And he might be talking about a specific illness. He might be talking about a weakness. More likely, he was talking about the life of hardship that he led and the stress that he lived as a whole. But remember, last week, he didn't have to do this. He wanted to do this. He was called to this. He wanted to do this, right? And so... The false apostles, you know, right, the super apostles, they would never dream of boasting in such things that Paul was boasting about, right? I mean, they thought that any kind of infirmity, any kind of weakness made you look super weak and far from God. Not that you were close to God. It made you look like you were far from God. And despite that, Paul's like, you know what? I don't care if I look foolish in the eyes of the world. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm here to please Jesus with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. It doesn't matter if I look foolish to the world, okay? Or look foolish to the Corinthian church because they are thinking as the world thinks, as the false apostles are. Because you know why? Paul said, I'm living with an eternal perspective. I'm living for the day. I'm not living for today. I'm living for the day. I'm living for an eternal perspective, not the worldly perspective. My eyes aren't down here. My eyes are fixed on him, like a flint fixed on the prize. And so I'm not living. Remember last week he said, on the other side of suffering is eternity. Right? On the other side of suffering is eternity. So he's like, I am going to live with an eternal perspective. And ladies, we need to live that way. We need to live that way. Right, to live for the day. Remember the Bema seat, right? To live, what, what is this going to look like at the Bema seat, remember? To live with that eternal perspective and not with this worldly perspective. He's like, look, at, I'm not going to boast about my natural powers, my natural gifting, acquired powers, 
um, in, neither in God or what he's done in me. He says, I am going to boast in what I have suffered for him. That's what I'm going to boast in. Because he's worthy. Because he's worthy. Because you know why? Because he used to be Saul. Saul of Tarsus. And he knows how forgiven he is. And now he's Paul. That should be how we are as well. Right? Those who are forgiven much, love much. Those who are forgiven much, love much. And so he says, look at The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows I'm not lying. So he's using some really strong language here because he realizes that the Corinthian Christians are going to doubt him. They're going to doubt him. Okay? Not only are they going to doubt that, oh, you didn't live that part of a life, Paul. I mean, really? You're boasting about this? Look at all the stuff you went through. You couldn't possibly have lived through that. So they're doubting him on that. And they're actually, you know, doubting him on boasting of such hardship. Because who boasts of their hardships? I mean, that would sound idiotic to them. You don't boast of your hardships. You know, you boast of how well you're doing, right? You boast of that, right? And so Paul is using this very strong language to declare God as his witness, I am telling you the truth. I am telling you the truth. He says, God knows. Well, God knows what? Well, God knows all the suffering I've gone through. And God knows all the trials I've gone through. And he knows what I'm telling you is all fact. And he knows this, okay? And, and so he led me to triumph in every single situation. He led me in triumph in every single situation. And God knows. And there is the secret of his deepest boasting. Because God knows. And he's the one that has led him through all of that. I love when he gives that example about Damascus. And in Damascus, I was you know, let down in a basket outside the wall through a window. And so... This might have been perhaps his first hardship that he ever went through, that he's remembering, okay? His first peril that he ever went through and that he faced for Jesus' sake. That's in Acts 9, 23 through 25. And so he thinks back to this beginning event, and perhaps he's thinking about this escape, excuse me, from Damascus as like his like his apprentice apprenticeship in persecution. It's like, all right, here we go. Here we go. This is like the apprenticeship in persecution, right? And it's like he's saying, this is how my ministry began, and this is how my ministry is going to continue. And so when you look at that escape, it's, the, it's, it's absolutely full of the person being frail and weak because he had to be put into a basket to escape and let down over a wall. Now think about this. It it illustrates with power the contrast between Saul of Tarsus, who he used to be, right, before he came to know Jesus, right? Saul of Tarsus and Paul the Apostle. So, So think about Saul of Tarsus. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus, right? On the road to Damascus. But he was on that road full of what? Full of man's power full of man's authority, full of worldly thinking. He was busy killing Christians, okay? Now think about how he's leaving Damascus. And he's leaving Damascus, how? Being dropped over a wall, escaping in a basket. I mean, talk about humility. He came in, mm, mm, right? Man strong, man authority, and this, this, and he leaves with such humility. I mean, is there anything more descriptive of weakness than being let down over a wall in a basket? So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the power of weakness right now. When I was studying this, I'm like, you know, Lord, we just can't stop there. We just can't stop right there because we need to talk about the power of weakness. We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians for a bit. But weakness in our lives is often looked at as a source of shame and embarrassment. 
weakness in our lives is often looked at as a source of shame and a source of embarrassment. Y you look at your inadequacies and you say things like, oh, I can't, I can't, or, or I, I don't have it in me, or, or you know, and, oh no, not me, that, that'll never happen, that'll never happen. So when you do that, you know what you're doing? You're limiting God. You're limiting God. You're putting God in a box, here's the box, and you're sitting here and saying, I can't do that. And he's going, well, no, you can't. I can. Let me out of the box. I can. I'm limitless. I am limitless. I don't look at that weakness as a shame or embarrassment. I'm your strength. I'm the one who's going to do that in and through you. See, weaknesses were something that Paul boasted in. He boasted in those. Think of this. He boasted in the insults that people gave him. He boasted in the distresses he went through. He boasted in the persecutions he went through. He boasted in the difficulties that he went through. A and he came to know the incredible power of weakness. The incredible power of weakness. Why? Because weakness kept him on his knees. Weakness kept him absolutely knowing, God, if you don't do this, it can't be done. But I know you. I know you. And it keeps me on my knees. It keeps me experiencing you and, and, and praying to you and knowing who you are, knowing your character, knowing your promises, knowing you'll come through because that's who you are. And so weakness kept him on his knees. Remember in verse 30, once again, he said, if I must boast in chapter 11, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my what? Weakness that will show my weakness, okay? You guys, that sounds so contradictory, doesn't it? It sounds so contradictory. We usually boast in our strengths, and it's contrary to what the world tells us to do. The world says we're nuts, right? And that's not what you do, right? But we need to be aware of the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. We have to be aware of the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. So let's go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, and uh, let's read from uh, 25 to 31. 1 Corinthians 1, 25 to the end of the chapter. This is Paul speaking. And he's saying, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Let's read that again. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. My two favorite words. But God, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, what? Boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay? Now listen. Paul pointed out that at Christ's greatest point of weakness on the cross. Remember, he went there as all God and all man. Remember, it's like, Father, for, you know, uh, Father, if you can take this from me, if you can take this from me, right? That was the old man speaking, right? And then he's like, nevertheless, what, whatever your will is, your will be done. I'm ready. I'm ready. It's your will, your will. So Paul pointed out that at Christ's greatest point of weakness on the cross, the weakness of God is stronger than man. That's what he said in 25. The weakness of God is stronger 
than man. So we're going to look at God's perspective on the power of weakness and how we can boast in it. Okay? So let's go through this. Let's, let's look at 26 through 31, which, I just re- which we just read together, and let's look at this together. Okay? So what does God choose? In verse, uh, what, 27? What does he choose? He chose the what? Foolish things of the world, right? In verse 27, he chose the foolish things of the world. What else did he choose in 27? The weak things of the world. So he chose the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world. What about in verse 28? What did he choose? Lowly things. He chose the lowly things of the world. What else did he choose in verse 28? Despised. He chose the despised things of the world and the things that are not, the things that are nullified, the things that are not. And in verse 30, he chose you and me in Christ Jesus. He chose you and me in Christ Jesus. So, so what does God choose? I love this. Look, listen. He chooses the foolish things of the world. He chooses the weak of the world. He chooses the lowly of the world. He chooses the despised things of the world. He chooses the things that are not, right? It's like those are nullified. He chooses you and me in Christ Jesus, okay? Why has God chosen people like this? He tells us. He chose the foolish things of the world to do what in verse 27? To shame the wise. To shame the wise. So he chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong, to shame the strong, okay? Why has God chosen people like this? To shame the wise, to shame the strong, okay? In verse 28, to nullify the things that are, right? So that no one, so that no one can boast before God and say, I did this, I did this. See, God wants all the glory. He's a jealous God. He wants all the glory, right? And and he doesn't want to have glory robbers. And he wants all the glory. So he says, so that no one can boast before God and take credit for it. In verse 30, in verse 30, why has God chosen people like this? So that Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our holiness or sanctification. He is our redemption. That's who he is. That's why he chose us, right, in Jesus Christ, because Christ is what? Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our redemption. And verse 31 sums it up. So if we're going to boast... We're going to boast in the Lord. So if we're going to boast, we're going to boast in the Lord because this is what he chooses and this is what he does through those people. I want to be that person, right? Would you want to be a fool for Jesus? Amen. Amen, right? Amen. Absolutely. And let him work in and through me. So, So finally from the text, does it matter then? Does it matter then who God chooses? Yeah, it does. Because guess what? He wants to receive all the glory. Yes, he wants to receive all the glory. And we won't take his glory to be our own. We won't say that we're doing this. We will boast in our what? Weakness. The power of weakness. Because it's he that's doing it in and through us. We couldn't possibly do that. That's why we do what? Our main theme verse. We trust the unseen. We trust the unseen, which is eternal. We don't, that's right. Cindy's got it on. Trust the unseen. A three or four, excellent. We trust the unseen, right? We don't, yeah, Pat does, excellent. We trust the unseen. We don't trust the scene. The scene is what? Temporary. And it looks pretty yucky at times, but not the unseen, right? The power in weakness. Why? As we trust the unseen and there is power in and through our weakness because he's doing it in and through us, others will watch you and they will marvel and then they will boast in the Lord. They're not going to boast about you. 
because you're weak, but not God in and through you. They're going to see Jesus in and through you. They will boast and marvel in the Lord. That's not who that person is. How could that possibly be? Oh, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And they'll boast and marvel in the Lord. So if you feel in, inadequate in comparison to others, maybe to others' talents, maybe to others' abilities, maybe to others' gifts, okay? Have you begun to see now what God wants you to know about yourself through these verses? Okay, let's read that again. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble, noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So what did you learn about boasting? <clears throat> God wants us to boast only in what? Who? In him. in him. He only wants us to boast in him, in the Lord. You don't boast to the Lord about what you've done. Okay? You're not boasting to the Lord about what we have, like, accomplished for him. Like, you don't go through the Lord and say, oh, you know, I smiled at this person, Lord, today. Oh, and I bought, like, in McDonald's, I bought the persons behind me. I bought their stuff. And, you know, I, I came today, and I've been studying the Bible. And, you know, I say, I say, how am I today? Oh, I'm highly favored, richly blessed. And I do all that. And I actually shared the gospel with one person today. And look what I did for you, Lord. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's, that's not what we do. That's not what we do. He's like, look it. I want you to boast only in me. I'm the one in you and working in your weakness. I don't want you to boast to me about what you've accomplished for me because we can't accomplish it. Only Jesus in me. Only Jesus in me. Only Jesus in you can do that because he's what? He says he's our wisdom. He is our wisdom. Jesus is our wisdom. He's our righteousness. He's the one who made us right with God. He's the one that took our, the hit on the cross and made us right with God so we could have a relationship, right? So that we could continue on. With what? With the same thing that Jesus was doing on earth, sharing the gospel, the good news, the good news. He is our holiness. He is our sanctification. He is the one that we just continue to do the next right thing, next right thing, next right thing. Jesus is that, okay? And then he is our redemption. He's redeemed us forever and ever and ever. And so understanding these truths helped Paul to overcome what he deemed his deficiencies, what he deemed his deficiencies, what he deemed his timidity in his sharing, in the great task that God had called him to. And it's the same thing with you and me. It's the same thing with you and me, because when we're weak, he's strong. And so there's power, power in weakness. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 2, okay, 1 Corinthians 2, and read 1 through 5. <clears throat> 2, 1 through 5. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. And he's talking about, right, the false apostles, the super apostles who are doing that. But with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, 
so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. On God's power. See, Paul knew he had nothing to say to them that would change their hearts and lives. Nothing. I have nothing to tell you in men's wisdom to change your hearts and lives. Only Jesus Christ and him crucified could do that. And it's the same today. I could sit up here and, you know, try to encourage you in this, 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 unless the Holy Spirit was speaking in and through me in his word, you're never going to be changed. You're never going to be changed. I'm never going to be changed. This isn't a self-help group. That's a temporary little thing. This isn't self-help. This is the mighty, powerful, living, active word of God that cuts between sinew and bone, that changes us, changes us from glory to glory to glory. He's like, look what we do. I'm only going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. Because that's enough. Because the whole of eternity past, the whole of now, and the whole of eternity future lies on that cross. The crux of the whole world and eternity past and eternity future is that cross. That's the power the power he already won on the cross that's the power that's why he can be our holiness he can be our wisdom he can be our righteousness right he can be our sanctification that's why because he took it all on the cross and he says look i'm not going to preach anything that's eloquent or anything that says that like the false apostles are doing these super apostles i'm going to preach nothing except jesus christ and him crucified period period the power, the power of the cross. And so he allowed the power of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, to speak through him just as a cracked pot, just as a vessel, just as a vessel, so that, so that he would point people to Jesus, not to him. The false apostles were pointing people to, look how great I am, I speak so well, I look so great, look at me which doesn't do anything to transform anyone. Only Jesus Christ can do that. You ever try to change someone? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And why do you think Paul kept on his knees, remembering his weakness? Because there's power in his weakness. Because only Jesus can do this. Only he can do this. Only Jesus can do this. We wanted to point people to Jesus and not to himself. And then Jesus would receive all the glory. See, don't you want to be like Paul and walk into a situation and not depend on anything else but the power of God? Any situation you walk into, any situation you walk into, and not depend on anything or anyone else but the power of God. God, if you don't do this, it can't be done. But I trust you. I'm trusting the unseen. And I'm going to keep doing the next right thing, next right thing, next right thing. And in your time and in your way, I know that I know. I know you, God. I know your character. I know your promises. I know your power. And I'm going to continue being weak because you're so strong because you're so strong. Ladies, he wasn't bringing a wow message to the Corinthians so that they would be impressed with him. Many a time, not with our own MFM events, but many a time when I'm asked to speak at other um, retreats or other conferences, other, I will have someone call me and they'll know of me, and they'll know this, this. They'll say, so what do you have new, Margot? What do you have new? You know, what, what do you have that can really wow somebody? Or what do you have that's really, you know, that, that can really, you know, entertain them and this, this, and everything? And, and I will say, you know, I think you have the wrong person. You know, I think you have the wrong person. And then on the phone, I'll pretty much go dead silent. And I'll say, you know, it's not about me. I said, um, you know, 
It's what he does in and through me, and it's always the old, old message right here that will become new to someone every time. Because the Holy Spirit takes it. And he takes it, and he makes it new in you. And he transforms you, and he conforms you. And so it's the old, old message that I will gratefully share but I will only count on the power of the Holy Spirit to excite those women to know Jesus Christ personally and passionately and powerfully and preeminently. And when I share that, usually they'll go, oh yeah, that's what I meant. Oh yeah, that's what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. That's what I meant. I'm like, okay, if that's what you meant, then I can be there. But uh, if you want a dog and pony show and something entertaining and, you know, uh, very, you know, uh, elaborate or uh, all about me, I'm not showing up. It's just like our Bible studies. Ladies, if it ever gets to the point where, you know, I'm not totally listening to the Holy Spirit and letting him speak, I'm leaving. I, kick me off. Because there's no power in that. There's no power in that. We're here to be changed. So guess what? We can continue the ministry, right? To disciple the next, to disciple the next, to disciple the next, to live in power, right? To his power in our weakness. That's why we continue to walk on. Don't you want to be like Paul and show up in any situation and just depend on absolutely the power of God? Because he will come through. He will not fail you. He will come through time and time and time again. And Paul would just show up and be persecuted. But somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit would come through and many, many people would come to know Jesus in and through him. Because what did he do? He shared what? He shared what they truly needed. He shared the truth about Jesus Christ and him crucified, his death, his burial, his resurrection, right? He's making a home for us. He's coming again to get us, you know, or we're going home to him, whatever, however he wants to work that out. It's just fine with me, right? Because we'll be with him forever and ever and eternity. We'll be talking about this. We'll be seeing each other and having like, you guys remember? Or we used to be like here and this is going to be so great, remember? And look where we are. Oh, are you kidding? Truth, truth, the truth the salvation that only Jesus Christ brings to all who believe in him, to all who believe in him, to all who believe in him. <laughs> Paul absolutely knew it was in vain to boast in man. It was in vain to boast in man. There, there's not going to be any fruit. There's nothing in that. Might be able to puff yourself up for a little bit, but there's no lasting fruit to boast in man. Our significance is not in who we are, but whose we are. Not who we are, not who I am. Whose I am. I'm his. I'm his. My self-esteem rests in the fact that he chose to die for me. As Joe Briscoe would call us, little dust balls. <laughs> little dust balls that he died for and that he lives for, right? whose we are, and then in what we have because we belong to him. We're in his family. We're in his family. We're these wonderfully adopted kids in Christ. We're in his family. So I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 3. Chapter 3, and now verse 18 to the end of the chapter. 3 of 1 Corinthians 18 to the end of the chapter. Paul's speaking. He says, Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, 
in Christ is of God. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he's wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. That is why you can boast in your weakness. That is why you can boast in your weakness. Because of what we just read. Because it's absolutely foolish to have the wisdom of the world. So now with the time that we have left, actually I didn't bring my phone. Time? Thank you. Time we have left, let's go to 2 Corinthians, back to our 2 Corinthians, okay? And we're going to go to chapter 12, the beginning of chapter 12. And we're going to continue to see Paul's power in weakness. Now, this is Paul's vision that he had and, uh, his, and its legacy in his life. I want you to know that Paul never told anyone this vision for 14 years. Just so you know, if I had a vision that Paul did, I'd be like, whoa, you guys, are you serious? Right? And this is why God doesn't give me these things, right? This is why. Because it'd be like, oh my word, you guys are this. Okay, no. Paul, in his weakness, in his humility, right? This was between God and him, right? And God allowed him to see this vision. And he kept it on the quiet for 14 years. And he thought at this point he needed to boast about it. And he boasts about it in the third person because he's so humble, he doesn't want the Corinthian Christians to even think that it's him. But in verses 6 and 7, we find out that it is because he mentions it's him. But you can see, meanwhile, he had been boasting about his weaknesses. He had been boasting about his insults. He had been boasting about his persecutions. He had been boasting about his hardships in the first person. But not this. This he hadn't said anything for 14 years. And then he only brought it up in the third person. So let's read 12 verses 1 through 6. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Humble Paul. Humble Paul. He's reluctantly describing his vision. Now, the super apostles, okay, the false teachers among the Corinthian Christians, um, no doubt claimed that they had had many visions, many revelations, okay, and many experiences. And now Paul is reluctantly boasting about his vision that he received of the Lord. And you can see his reluctance in the opening part of that of this chapter, right? And so he's tired, he's absolutely tired about writing about himself. He wants to be writing about Jesus, and he's tired about writing about himself, okay? Uh, but, but the worldly thinking that made the Corinthian Christians think little of Paul also made them think little of Jesus. And so he says, so I will reluctantly boast. 
Now, visions and revelations, okay? They happen more than you know in the New Testament, whether they concern angels or Jesus or heaven or other things, okay? These things are more common in the New Testament than we might think. So I'm gonna give you some examples, just a few, so you can see some examples. You can just write down the addresses. We're not going to look them up, but I will give you a few of different visions or revelation um, that other, uh, others in the Bible have had. The first one is Zechariah. Zechariah, okay? If you remember, he was married to Elizabeth, okay? And Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, okay? And they hadn't had a child yet. And Zechariah was in the temple. It was his turn to be in the temple. He was right next to the altar of incense. And a vision of an angel appeared to him and said, hey, Zach, buddy, that's in my translation. Okay, you're going to have a kid with Elizabeth, your, your, your wife. And I know you're old. I mean, I know her womb is closed up and everything, but you know what? You are. You're going to have a kid, okay? And he didn't believe it. He didn't believe it. He had unbelief. And so, do you remember what happened to him? He was not able to speak until his son was born. And then his first words out of his mouth were what? His name will be John. And that's John the Baptist. John the Baptist. That is in, what is that in? That is in um, Luke. Luke 1, 8 through 23. And by the way, that wasn't just any old angel. That was Gabriel, one of the archangels. Okay, now, the women, the women who went to visit Jesus' tomb had a vision of angels. Remember that? It was like, he's not here, he's gone, right? He had a vision of angels. That's in Luke uh, 24, 22 through 24. So he said, no, Jesus is alive, you know, he's gone. Now, the next one was Stephen at his stoning, at his stoning, okay? And Stephen saw a vision of Jesus at his death. And by the way, do you know whose coat they found at Stephen's stoning? Saul's. Saul. So he was at his stoning. Saul, who became Paul. So at his stoning in Acts 7, 55 and 56, he's dying and he looks up and he sees into heaven and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. And he looks at them, remember what he says? Looks at Jesus and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And then it says, and then he fell asleep. And then he fell asleep. Okay, in Acts 9, verse 10, this is about Ananias. Ananias um, experienced a vision, and he was, he was told to go and tell Saul and go and find him and tell Saul that, you know, he's going to see again now, okay? And Ananias is like, uh, God, do you know who Saul is? I mean, you know, he's not a very nice guy. I mean, you know what he's been doing, right? And, and I love it. And God's like, no, it's okay. You, you go, and he's going to be on straight street. He's going to be in this room. He's going to be this, and you're just going to be able to tell him this is it, and he's going to be able to see again. And so Ananias experienced this vision, and he went and did as God told him to do. Okay, Peter, good old Peter, had a vision of an angel at his release from prison. That's in Acts 12, verse 9. Peter was like, you know, in prison between two guards, watched 24-7, chained as well. And meanwhile, the day before, James had just, um, they had just killed James with a sword. And so Peter was going to go before a trial. And of course, then it would be, you know, his death was impending. And so he has his vision of angel, and angel, right, is like, uh, no, come on, come with me, that's it. Chains fall off and everything. And they, like, step over the guards, you know, and, like, walk out. See, it's not over till Jesus says it's over. Right? In Paul's life, in Peter's life, in my life, in your life, it's not over until Jesus says it's over. Right? God, if you don't do this, it can't be done. What's another one? Okay, John. John, the disciple John in Revelation, right? He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's been exiled there. 
and that's where he ends up dying in his 90s. And meanwhile, what? What does he get? The revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible, really he gets the revelation of Jesus Christ. He gets to peer into heaven, and he gets to tell us a bit what it's going to look like. How great is that, right? Talk about visions that God allowed him to have as he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. The whole book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, then Paul, let's go back to Paul. In uh, Acts 16, 9 and 10, he had a vision from a man from Macedonia. And that man kept asking him to come to that region and help and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit had kept Paul and his consorts from going to Asia, where they were headed, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in a vision, he sees this man from Macedonia calling him to go to Macedonia and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. Also in Acts 18, verse 9 through 11, he had a really, Paul had a really encouraging vision uh, while he was in Corinth, like we're talking now, okay? So he would show up in different cities and he would teach in the synagogue, right? He would teach in the synagogue. And uh, then the Jewish people would come and, you know, persecute him and push him out and, you know, say, this isn't truth and get out of here and this, this, uh, because that can't possibly be, that's not the Messiah, that's not who it is. And so um, they would become very abusive. Okay, so um, the vision that happened is that uh, when he was in Corinth for uh, a year and a half, it said, look at, God spoke to him. He said, you're going to take this to the Gentiles. You're going to take this to the Gentiles. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. And the last one I'll tell you is that Paul had a vision uh, of an angel on the ship that was just about to be wrecked. Okay, he went through many shipwrecks, uh, but this is in Acts 27, 23 through 25. So Paul's on this ship, you know, in a, a huge storm and this, this, and everything. They're all freaking out and everything. And he says, look at, look at, just hold on a minute. God told me in a vision that I have to go before Caesar. So guess what? We're all going to live. Don't worry about this. I mean, it looks pretty rotten. The scene looks pretty rotten here, right? As we're pitching and yawing, we're all going to live. Right? I have to go see Caesar, so just you know, hang on to the boat. We're going to go into an island here soon, but we'll be fine. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Isn't that so great? Right. Visions, revelations, okay, and so he is telling his vision. He's telling his revelation. He says, I know a man in Christ in this, in this. He says, I know a man in Christ, and he describes it in the third person instead of the first person, and, and, and so he's, he's being very humble about this vision, and, and so it's a remarkable spiritual experience that he's had, and, and just think about the super apostles, you know, that how they would talk about their spiritual experiences, right? Okay, they would probably be wanting to glorify themselves. They'd probably be wanting to write a book about it, right? Go on a speaking tour about it, right? This, this, this. And meanwhile, he could hardly, hardly talk about it because he didn't want to bring any glory to himself. And so 14 years ago, right? He says, uh, this is what happened 14 years ago. Now, they're not quite sure when this happened. Um, maybe it happened when Paul was uh, 10 years in Cilicia or Syria, or maybe it was um, at his stoning at Lystra, or maybe it was uh, during his time in Antioch. They're not quite sure when it happened, but he's talking about that it was 14 years prior. And that's the important thing. The important thing is that Paul kept quiet about this for 14 years, and now he mentions it reluctantly. And I love this. He goes, whether I was in the body, uh, you know, I went up in the body, I don't know. Whether it was just, you know, my spirit, I don't know. I don't know if it was in the body. I don't know if it was just, you know, um, you know my spirit. I, it seems, you know, it seems in his mind either one was possible. And he says it twice. He says it twice, okay? You, you might ask, well, what really happened to Paul? Well, what, what happened to him? Was he carried up in his body or was, did he just see through eyes of faith, like with a vision? How, what, what was it? And, and here it is. We don't know. Because you know why? Paul doesn't know. It wasn't important. It wasn't important. He doesn't know. Speculation would be ridiculous. 
okay? He could not decide himself, so it's ridiculous for you and me to attempt it. Like, I don't know. Was I taking it on the body or was it like through my eyes of faith? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is I was taken up to the third heaven. You guys know there's three heavens, right? Okay, there's first the atmosphere. Okay, that's what we can breathe. Okay, we're walking around. This is the atmosphere that we can breathe. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is when you're up in a plane and all the starry hosts and way beyond that, okay, where you can't breathe. Okay, that's, that's the starry heaven, the starry heaven. Like when we get to Fort Wilderness and you go through and you do the lantern walk and you look out and you see all the glorious stars, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is where God lives and reigns. That's where God lives and reigns. That's his throne. That's his throne. Throne of divine glory. Place of blessedness. That's the third heaven. And it talks about third heaven all the time through the word of God. So, Paul, as we understand, was caught up to heaven where God lives. And Paul had a vision of an experience of the throne of God. Just like Isaiah did. You guys remember when we studied Isaiah? Isaiah 6 verse 1, what does Isaiah say? I see the Lord high and lifted up, seated, seated on his throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And the seraphims, the angels that worshipped him, went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Isaiah looked at him and said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. That was his calling. Here am I, Lord. Send me. So Isaiah had seen that vision. And then we see that John, as we talked about in Revelation, he had seen a vision of heaven. And he, in Revelation 4, 1 and 2, uh, John says there was a door standing open in heaven. There was a door standing open in heaven. And in it, there was a throne. And someone was on the throne. And it would look like jasper and, and clear. And then his throne was a total rainbow of light. His throne was a total rainbow of light. And, and encircled it, there were the seraphim, and they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right over and over again, who was and is and is to come. And so he saw this vision. He saw this vision of God sitting on his throne and of heaven, and how the sea looks like glass in front of his throne. And so Paul has seen a vision as well, just like Isaiah did, just like Revelation did, and just like John did, I should say, in Revelation. And Paul says, I heard these inexpressible words, words that are not lawful for any man to utter. Notice he didn't say what he saw. He didn't say what he saw. He talked about what he heard. In describing this heavenly vision, Paul doesn't relate anything to what he saw, only a shadowy description of what he heard. Now remember, Paul waited 14 years to describe this incident, and when he finally did, he said it reluctantly. And he did everything he could in relating this story to take the what? The focus off of himself. Take the focus off of himself, such as writing in the third person. And, and you know, he doesn't bother at all with, I'm sure, what he saw, breathless descriptions of this vision. Breathless descriptions of what he actually had experienced. And instead, he says nothing of what he saw and says only of things that he heard, but those things he cannot utter because they're inexpressible words that no man would understand. Doesn't that just make you yearn to see Jesus face to face with the visions that they've seen and with what Paul is talking about? He couldn't even utter it. So, so what does Paul hear? What does he hear? We don't know. We don't know. 
They're inexpressible words. We don't know. God didn't want us to know. If he wanted us to know, guess what? It'd be right here. We have everything we need for life and godliness right here. If you wanted us to know, it'd be there. So you don't need to pontificate about it. Okay? That's not the point of it. Okay? He, he, he doesn't want us to know. He didn't give Paul permission to speak. He didn't. And so he didn't. Now, when I was studying this and everything, of course, there's all kinds of commentators, and um, they can't resist speculating, right? Commentators can't. So one of them says, um, it is probable that the apostle refers to some communication concerning the divine nature and the divine economy, of which he was only to make a general use in his preaching and writing. No doubt that what he learned at this time formed the basis of all of his doctrines. Which could be true, right? Which absolutely could be true, but we don't know. We don't know, so we don't need to speculate, okay? But he, Paul goes on to say, look at of such a one, I'm not going to boast. I'm not going to boast yet myself. I'm not going to boast, except I'm going to boast in my infirmities. I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. Do you guys get this yet? This is where I'm going to boast, okay? He says, I'm basically the nameless man that I just said in the third person, okay, who really had this vision. I really have something to boast about, but I'm not going to boast about it because I'm going to boast about in my weakness because when in my weakness, he's strong. He's power. He's power over and over and over again. He already boasted in chapter 11 in all of his infirmities, all of his, all of his troubles, right? He says, though I might desire to boast, I would be a fool. Just like those false apostles. Just like those super apostles. And so he's like sharply and sort of humorously contrasting himself to those super apostles. Like, you know what? I'd be a fool. I'm not going to do that. I know you guys are going to, you know, probably, you know, you know, talk about this, talk about that, and, and it's, it's all false, it's all false, but you probably make it bigger than life, and you probably, like I said, write books, you know, make, make all kinds of videos, go on speaking tours, because, you know, you, you're talking about a vision. And if they did, each of them would be a fool. Each of them would be a fool. And Paul will not be a fool. He will not be a fool. So he will not boast about his vision. But at the same time, he wants to communicate to the Corinthian Christians, I've had these experiences. I've had these experiences, okay? And, you know, often I think it's easy to think, I think it's easy to think that the only ones who have had profound experiences with God are those who boast about them constantly. Those who've had profound experiences with God are those who boast about them constantly. And Paul never, ever did boast as the super apostles did. However, he had profound experiences with God, just like you do, just like I do. Right? When you're sitting and you're, and you're dwelling in the Word and you're hearing Him and you're walking and, and you're talking to Him and you're praying and this is, you have profound, Profound experiences with him. when he says, "Hey, Margo, do this. Walk there. Call this person." Profound experiences with God, over and over and over again. And the proof of the profound experiences that Paul had with God was found how in his transformed life. In his transformed life, and the powerful, truthful ministry that he had. And it's the same with us. It's in our transformation. That's how you know you've met profoundly with him. Because you're hearing from him. And you're obeying him. And you're being profoundly changed. And you want to please him and not yourself anymore. You're profoundly changed. Therefore, Paul thought it was really, really important to mention the experience, but not to dwell on it in any way. He wasn't trying to sell himself to the Corinthian Christians, right? In fact, he held back on the description. He just kept saying, I'm forbearing here, I'm forbearing, because he didn't want to persuade the Corinthian Christians that he was just another super apostle. That's not who I am. And if the Corinthian Christians thought that Paul was weak and different from the super apostles, that was just fine with Paul. That was just fine with him. 
And you know what? It should be just fine with us as well. Wow, Margaret, you're quite a Jesus freak. Yep. <laughs> so good. So good. He's so great. I'm such a jerk. He's so strong. I'm so weak. You got it. That's such a compliment. Let me like, yeah. How great is that? Right? Absolutely. We're weak. He is strong. Right? And he says, look, I, I'm just fine with that. I, I, I want to be fooled for Jesus. Absolutely. Because as, he shames the wise in that. He shames the wise in that. And he wanted the Corinthian Christians to see. What did he want them to see? The glory of God expressed in weakness. The glory of God expressed in his weakness. Not to see him as great. Not to see him as this super duper apostle, right? As they claim to be. He wanted them to see Jesus in him. And that's my only prayer. When I'm teaching, when I'm sharing, when I'm talking to our neighbors, Lord, don't let them see me. Let them see Jesus in me. Let them see Jesus in me. Because only he will transform someone. Only he will transform someone. So why was Paul, in closing, why was Paul given this vision? Why was he given this vision? First of all, he was given it so you and me, that we would benefit, that you and I would benefit from what the Lord showed Paul. That you and I would benefit. That's why it's written down in God's word forever and ever and ever. And secondly, it was given because of what God told him through this vision sustained him. It sustained him through all of his trials in the ministry. It sustained him. It enabled Paul to give everything and do everything that God was planning on doing in and through him. That he'd give everything God wanted him to give to all generations. It sustained him profoundly. Profoundly having this experience sustained him. And that vision helped Paul finish his course. He finished well. He wants you to finish well. He wants me to finish well. He wants you to sit and listen to him and dwell in his word and have your non-negotiable face-to-face and come to Bible study and just be so enraptured with him so that you can be sustained by his power, his power, because we're weak. We're weak. We're in a squalid and polluted society. But he's already got it done in the heavenly. And we get to walk with him and talk with him and join him in what he's doing. Remember in Isaiah? We're on the highway to holiness, baby. This is where we are. We're not here. We're not in the muck and mire of the world. We are here. Right now. Right now. And if we can share Jesus and be Jesus to those who so need it like Paul, so be it. So be it. Next week we're going to talk about how God allowed a thorn in Paul's flesh and what that looks like and what that looks like and why that was allowed. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that Paul heard these inexpressible words and knew he couldn't utter them, but knew that they were profoundly from you. And it sustained him somehow, some way. And he wanted others around him especially the Corinthian Christians, God, to see, to see the glory of God expressed in his weakness. And Lord, that's what we want to. That the glory of God would be expressed in our weakness because there's power in weakness. And that people wouldn't see us as great but that you are the great God in and through us. And you're the one who sustains us. And you're the one who gives us the vision to finish well, to finish the course. Not just Paul, but us. 
And so, God, we give you praise. We give you praise. We adore you, Lord. We thank you. And Jesus, I ask for this Saturday morning. I ask for this spring refresh, Lord. This is your agenda. This is your doing. This is your worship. This is your teaching. This is you, God. I'm asking that every woman, that you are drawing them, every woman, God, to every seat that you have for them. And that they would hear from the Holy Spirit exactly what they need to hear and that they'd be transformed and conformed to the likeness of your Son. And perhaps some coming to know you for the very first time personally. God, this is yours. May the people on platform be super weak so that there would be power in that weakness because you are strong when we are weak. So God, may we get out of the way. May we get out of the way and enjoy the freedom of what you already have done in the heavenlies. And we just get to join you. And so Lord, may it be a morning of, of rejoicing, a morning of transformation, a morning that you already see, because you're the God who sees everyone there and everyone respond. I ask that you would give us a hedge of protection of people coming and going in around the church. And I thank you that you have allowed this at this time and this place as we are coming out of the pandemic, God. And I thank you that we're able to um, be with Faith Bible Church, God. May you bless them. Thank you that there's such a light on that hill, Lord, as well. Thank you for River Glen. Thank you for Whitestone. God, thank you for these churches that, that just proclaim your name and partner with us, Lord God, in one, one reason only, to proclaim Christ and him crucified until we see you, 